Uh, very good morning to everyone. Ram Thornton and Fiki are delighted to welcome you to our joint webinar on challenges and the way ahead for the consumer and retail sectors as they recover from the massive impact of the current crisis of COVID-19. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. We have a very eminent list of speakers and we hope that you benefit immensely from their insights. Uh, on that note, let me uh, begin with introductions. Uh, uh, my fellow panelists today are Mr. Devendra Shavla, Co-Chair of Fiki Retail and Internal Trade Committee and Managing Director and CEO of Spencer Retail Limited. Mr. Chavla has kindly uh, agreed to moderate this session. Uh, welcome, Mr. Chavla. Mr. Kedar Upadhyay, Joint President and CFO CIPLA. Mr. Arjun Sharma, Chairman Select Group. Mr. Jamshed Dabu, Co-Chair of Fiki Retail and Internal Trade Committee, Independent Advisor, Consumer Retail Hospitality, and Ex-Managing Director, Trent Ico Markets Private Limited. Mr. Anupam Kumar, Chartered Accountant and Consumer and Retail Specialist. And I am Siddharth Nigam, National Managing Partner, Growth Advisory at Crown Thornton, India. Even before COVID-19 struck, companies in the consumer and retail sector were experiencing converging pressures ranging from intense competition to evolving customer preferences. The current crisis has magnified the problems for the sector with massive changes in demand supply dynamics and huge liquidity crunch. For manufacturers, brands, and retailers, it is going to be a very rocky road ahead. We are also running a survey on the sector, and my co-panelist Anupam will share highlights a little later. Some quick data points. On an overall basis, private consumption accounts for around 60% of GDP, and half of this is consumer spending on food and non-food items. The retail sector in, in India has close to 18 to 20 million traditional and modern retail outlets, cumulatively employing 50 million people. Around 10 to 12% of this workforce is in modern trade. The future of at least half of the, this base hangs in the balance, depending on how India's 250 million families will change their buying patterns in the, post, in the post COVID scenario. Around two thirds of consumer spending is on food, and this is not likely to see a very large impact, ex ex except at the premium end. The balanced large segments such as clothing and apparel, home products, jewelry, electronics, durables, et cetera, will see varying degrees of impact as consumers opt for better or cheaper deals or delay buying till later in the year. Clothing and apparel is likely to be the hardest hit segment. Let's look at retail. The lockdown has majorly impacted the retail business. Most stores except stores selling essential food and grocery have been shut across the country for almost a month now. Overall, we understand only about seven to 8% of outlets are open. Non-grocery, non-food retailers are reporting 80% reduction in sales. Even retailers of essential items are facing losses as they aren't allowed to sell non-essential items, many of which were higher margin products. Uh, the government notification on 15th April on resumption of operations partially from 20th of April included e-commerce companies uh, such as Amazon, Flipkart, and others. However, to enable a level playing field for smaller retailers, another notification for the government disallowed e-commerce from trading in anything but essentials. Uh, these account for about 93% of e-commerce sales in India. On the positive side, we are seeing some incredible jumps in this space. Consumers have been vocal about their inclination towards digital channels. And if early signs are to be believed, the Indian e-commerce sector will double from its current size of around 60 billion dollars much sooner than anticipated. Drawing from what we are seeing in China, consumers are likely to opt for online buying even after the lockdown ends. Some trends, big basket clocked twice as much traffic and revenue for the month of March, while average basket size was around 20% higher than normal days. Grofers, another uh, uh, hyper-local grocery player, saw an 80% saw an surge in number of orders mid-March, even before the lockdown was announced. And the amount spent by shoppers rose by 48%. By the second week of April, there were five times more active users on Grofer's app than normal. On a lighter note, I'm sure many of our participants today are spending considerable time on these apps, uh, praying for an early slot. We're also seeing some unique partnerships and alliances as companies grapple with the logistical hurdles. There are several last mile logistic partnerships being forged by FMCG and online delivery players. Uh, Marico with Zomato and Swiggy, ITC with Domino's, Big Bazaar with Rapido and Scootsy, and uh, uh, Mr. Chavla's own Spencer's with Uber, Rapido and Scootsy, just to name a few. While it's a win-win, there are also, I'm sure, incredible learnings for both brands as well as the online aggregators. In short, while there is doom and gloom of huge challenges facing the consumer and retail sectors, there are also pockets of reassuring growth 
And dare I say, there will be several opportunity areas in the post-COVID scenario. With this background, let me now hand over to our moderator for today, Mr. Devendra Chavla, who has rich leadership experience across consumer and retail value chain with several marquee global companies. He's an alumni of Harvard Business School. Mr. Chavla has held leadership positions with Coca-Cola, Asian Paints, Future Group, Walmart, and is now Managing Director and CEO of Spencer's Retail Limited. Uh, over to you, Mr. Chavla. Thanks, Siddharth, and I hope everyone can hear me. Welcome uh, to the panel with Fikki and Grant Thornton. I think we have a very eminent uh, panel, and even though there was an introduction, I think that was 10 minutes back, and I see a lot more people logged in. We have 148 now. That time it was 50. So for everyone's benefit, let me just introduce the panel. Uh, my friend here, Jamshed Dabu, is here. He, till recently, uh, was the managing director of... Uh, Trend, trend business, hypermarkets. I think he's now an independent advisor for consume, consumer, retail, hospitality. And he's still on the board of uh, Trend, which is a Tata and a Tesco JV. I think he has a very rich experience, uh, even of the tourism and travel industry. Let's say he used to be the chief operating officer for the Indian hotels, which is Taj. Uh, I'd also like to welcome Mr. Arjun Sharma, who's the chairman uh, of Select Group. It is India's renowned business uh, house which diversifies interest in shopping centers, travel, tourism, hospitality. I think their flagship uh, project is one of the best malls, perhaps number one in India called Select City Walk. Uh, 1.3 million square feet, a large one with housing many, many brands. We have Kedar from Sipla, who's the joint president and global CFO, joined the company in 2016 and is heading its finance, IT functions. Uh, we have Siddharth, who, who was just speaking earlier with Grant, Grant Thornton, and uh, he has worked across various transactions in sectors like merger and acquisition, private equity, fundraise, IPOs, project finance, uh, insolvency, and distressed special situations. So Siddharth, your job is going to get uh, a lot more added with coronavirus and uh, a lot of such issues coming up, I'm sure. He's worked with Pepsi in the past. And we have Anupam, who's a, a CA with over 20 years experience in areas of audit and accounting. Uh, and with this sector, Anupam has focused on complex topics such as leases and revenues and impairment. And I think lease right now between retailers uh, and mall is a hot subject and we will come to it. Anupam is a, a regular speaker at a lot of industry forums and uh, I think let me just set, set the stage uh, before we start uh, the conversation. I think Siddharth spoke of the times we live in and we all have been reading and we all get thousands of WhatsApp every day. So I will not go and state uh, what is happening. I think we all know we live in difficult times. However, I think every problem is an opportunity in disguise. Uh, and this COVID aftermath, I think has plunged our industries. In fact, all industries into crisis mode. Uh, it could be a rude uh, wake-up call for all of us. And uh, the impact of the coronavirus COVID-19 on the consumer industry, especially from which I come, is being very widely felt. I think business which rely on footfalls and uh, customers' consumption have been affected. And frankly, even if you're not in the consumption business, whether you're in finance, even pharma, everything has been affected badly. However, despite challenges, I think the much needed uh, essentials are pushing their limits. People like us, uh, people like Spencer's, Nature's Basket, uh, you know, Grofer's, Big Basket, more. I think people are pushing the limit on essentials, trying to serve the customer in, in such times of crisis so that essentials reach uh, customers' plate. I think pharma industry is in the driver's seat right now. A lot of focus uh, to keep lives safe to try and develop a vaccine, to try and develop some drugs uh, for the coronavirus to save humanity uh, you know, from plunging further. And I think though not classified as essential right now, but in our earlier times pre-COVID, you know, travel and tourism and hotels were also like an essentials. We really could not live without them. We had to fly. We all would go and stay somewhere. And this uh, industry is currently at a standstill. I think two factors have been impacting the consumer sentiment badly. One is knocking on confidence. I think it's really going down. I think the poor performance of financial markets 
and in these times normal tendency is uh, to save money and consumption gets impacted badly and then we have the supply side shock people like us uh, have been grappling with supplies early at least in the beginning it was uh, of a very higher magnitude it is coming down with every passing day to even get supplies uh, from uh, fmcg companies or food companies in essentials and i think currently we have demand side supply side and financial problem i think it's a unique situation with all three issues uh, firms have been facing supply chain challenges uh, you know limitation on cross state intra state movement of goods in the initial days which has become uh, a lot more better i think manpower availability people went back to villages delivery staff for people like us went down and uh, siddharth was saying that for one of the companies the number of orders online would have gone five times so for people like us who have also had an app it has actually gone even more than 10 times in fact we are able to deliver also a couple of multiple times so in that way i think companies have an, have a chance to pivot a lot of uh, physical retailers have a chance to become truly omni channel but the corona virus outbreak uh, may introduce new opportunities and i think uh, rather than focusing on the gloom and doom in which we'll spend a little bit of time only to understand what's happening in each industry i think uh, we should we should come up uh, with new set of uh, solutions because customer expect expectations will get reset i think even pharma which has had high dependence uh, on china for raw material can fundamentally look forward in these times to redefine uh, their value chain and i think crisis can lead to adoption of new technology and business models uh, as i was speaking in siddharth mentioned we tied up in two days with couple of companies like swiggy uber we were the first ones in which uber cars right now as we speak are delivering thousands of delivery phone delivery and uh, e-commerce delivery in fact we've now carved out in our sales report a new term called out of store sales so there in store sales and out of store sales and that's a very large chunk right now it used to be small so i think current rapid digital adoption uh, in public health and education signal towards a, a radical change and lastly i think the crisis may leave uh, some negative impact on globalization too but i think it's time to start looking beyond the crisis eventually we'll all have to come out and find solutions i think the future is definitely not what it used to be So what we're going to discuss is how can we manage the transition from lockdown to better times post lockdown how can a firm be relevant in post crisis era with faster tech adoption and this changing consumer behavior and I I will share some of the changes happening on food consumption and I think responsibility lies with us to steer on the wave of uh, uncertainty I think with that let me just uh, open up uh, the conversation and uh, let me start with Jamshed the uh, and jamshed i know uh, we've spoken this even on couple of other panels but i think just for uh, the sake of uh, all people present uh, on this webinar what do you think is the impact of this and how do you think it's going to be going forward for uh, retailers whether essentials or non essentials and malls see i think uh, obviously uh, other than food retail <laughs> the short term impact is being felt by everybody but however i think what will happen in the medium term is that professionally managed companies and professionally managed chains will now come out way ahead in the competitive game and there has been a situation in india wherein there is a plethora of players pushing down the price in that industry because of various uh, means adopted by them which may also include a certain amount of shortcuts etc etc and we will find that going forward those kind of players in any industry for that matter will start falling by the wayside and the more professionally ethically purposeful run companies will start coming out and winning and i personally feel that going forward customers will be more amenable to paying a decent price for companies which are offering products on their platform of trust transparency professionalism and sustainability this is something which we have always been hoping in the industry but never been able to uh, sort of uh, get customers to do so i do see that in the medium term the better companies will in fact become more advantage it will become more advantages for them and it is the not so good companies which will really struggle 
which is what essentially good quality competition is all about. And that's the way I, I see the positive aspect going forward for companies uh, in the game. No, oh, thanks, thanks, Jamshed. And I can't agree more. I think earning trust, you know, we used to all speak of consumer experience, but currently the word experience should be replaced by trust. So I think earning consumer trust that stores are safe, staff, you know, and earning our staff's trust because uh, thousands of them are out there, what we call our heroes, you know, working and even to earn their trust that they are able to report back on work now and even the post COVID or post lockdown, I think will become critical. Let me come to you, Arjun, you have one of the largest, highest footfall and one of the most successful malls. And we are in a time where footfalls may not just start. I mean, let's say the lockdown gets over whenever, let's say fourth or fifth or middle of May or whenever. I think we don't expect everybody will rush out and throng to the mall. So I'm sure you have thought of it. What is your plan and what do you think? Uh, is there any mitigation plan or business continuity plan? You can throw light on how life will be for the malls. Thank you, Devinder. Uh, thank you to Fiki and to uh, Grant Thornton for putting this together and uh, it's a very interesting panel. Um, so yeah, uh, shopping malls uh, are a part of organized retail. And um, over the last decade, we've actually seen that uh, this industry has uh, exponentially grown. It has allowed both Indian brands as well as international brands to partake in uh, the great Indian middle class story. Now, COVID-19 has obviously really put uh, everything into, into a tailspin because nobody and no business plan had ever had any contingency plan for something as severe where there is panic, there's fear, and because the whole, the whole enemy is unknown. Uh, we, we can't see it, we can't feel it, we can only just uh, experience it and, and suffer it. Now, uh, we did a very interesting uh, little dipstick with some of our loyal customers. And I know I've, I've heard about, uh, what Siddharth mentioned about, you know, the market doubling on the e-commerce side. So we, we just picked about seven, 800 of our customers. We started asking them that when this opens, what is it that you're going to come back for? What is it that you need? And we'll be actually surprised that the amount of um, lockdown that people have experienced in the last, you know, 31 days, um, they are frustrated. Um, they are very, very anxious. And I think they are looking to, to go to places like shopping malls um, and kind of feel free because malls were just not a place only for shopping. There were also a lot of social places, which, uh, which was uh, something that the cities never did. So if you looked at, celebrating a Diwali or an Eid or Christmas. These were all celebrated with much more pomp and, 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 and I think inclusiveness in shopping centers and in organized retail versus it being organized in cities and city centers. So we actually did a little bit deeper and what would you want to come back and buy? You'd be surprised what stood number one in the category was beauty. You know, uh, they said, we just want to come back, come back to the salons, come back to buying our makeup, baking, you know, all that things. Some people even said, look, um, you know, when is Chroma going to open? I need to buy a toaster. I need to get my Apple phone changed. So there was actually a lot of pent up demand. And we've seen that happen in China, that when China opened its shopping malls uh, in a controlled manner, there was this whole revenge shopping. There was this whole thing about, about coming back to the, the centers. Um, and, and some of the numbers that we are seeing currently on e-commerce and on groceries are also holding mentality that the consumer is reflecting at the moment. I don't think this is a long-term trend that you will see. Yes, there is a trend that people will certainly uh, you know, get used to buying online. But I, I believe that the shopping malls and organized retail will certainly be very relevant going forward. Now, the key really is when we open, how we open, and what kind of social distancing can we, can we impart. Uh, the challenges are obviously there. Uh, you know, each center has its own carrying capacity. And I think we'll be guided by the government that we obviously want to make sure that all our people, all our guests, all our shoppers are safe. And I think the challenge will be to manage that. And we're all still grappling with it. And I don't think uh, we will have an answer straight away. I think we will all live, learn and, and hopefully come out a bit stronger uh, and, and make this uh, industry work because it's not just about shopping centers. It's about the whole organized retail working in cahoots with each other. That is important. Thank you, Arjun. Thanks a ton. And I'm going to come back to you with one question. But let me go back to uh, go to Kedar. Kedar, you're in essentials in a manner. You are in uh, pharma. Uh, 
and Ciplas, like any other pharma companies, majorly in the niche. What is your experience? I'm sure, despite being in the business of uh, curing people, you would have never expected uh, something like this in our lifetime. So, how are you, your company, and more than Cipla? I'm sure you're in touch with your industry people. How's the pharma industry reacting to it, and what can we look forward uh, from the pharma space? No, no, absolutely. I mean, this is something which is uh, once in a lifetime, and none of us predicted it. Although, you know, being in this sector, and is and demand has not been in the fact that uh, more than half of the total medicines sold are for chronic diseases. You know, be it diabetes or hypertension or respiratory. Uh, I think we consider ourselves very fortunate that uh, we have, we will be able to protect the livelihoods of our employees, our vendors, our and we'll be able to support customers and our channel partners. Uh, to answer your question specifically, what we have noticed is the inward uh, procurement and supply chain is pretty much intact. So in terms of availability of raw material, APIs, packing material, excipients, we have been able to organize it uh, pretty well and we have a uh, pretty extended cover. What we are trying to uh, add on is the fact that the whole uh, you know employee base in manufacturing plants is able to safely operate in a compliant healthy safe environment and come back to the home center again next day come back to the offices so i think getting that in order that is number one challenge number two is obviously some of our customers in emerging markets and other geographies where their currencies have collapsed in terms of liquidity in terms of predictability of demand pattern because typically uh, as you know, CIPLA sells about 10% of India's medicines. So in volume terms, we are the largest uh, probably in India uh, between our prescription and generic medicines. So I think being able to predict the demand pattern, which therapies and which particular SKUs will sell is going to be a significant challenge. Because if we have a mismatch between what we have stocking vis-a-vis -vis what consumers want in this, in this particular time, I think the mismatch is going to cause havoc on our cash cycle and our liquidity. So I think the whole effort inside between the manufacturing teams, supply chain teams, and a little bit of teams who are in the ground, in the field, is to get the predictability of revenues in the next three to six months and organize ourselves internally appropriately so that we support patients during this need of the hour. So just to sum up, I, what I told you is the inward procurement, supply chain, uh, working from home for office category people, all that is working fine. But... Uh, you know, uh, there has been a cost escalation when it comes to distributing the goods to our domestic uh, stockists and international stockists. And what we are trying to get a handle on is the predictability of revenues. I would just add one thing uh, and, uh, you know, uh, half a minute statistics. As you know, out of the 1.3 billion people, 130 crore people we have in India, in the workforce category, there are only 50 crore people. And I, you know, when I uh, sort of got to know this yesterday, that out of this 50 crore, not more than three and a half, four crore people are in the organized salaried sector. So all of us put together, I mean, our colleagues on the call and similar colleagues who get salary on a routine basis are only four or five crore people. Balance, everybody is a daily wage laborer, casual laborer, self-employed, and there is tremendous hunger, tremendous destitution, tremendous deprivation around. So I think, you know, distributing the safety that we have to this class of people is going to be very important because we are in a way in an island and we can't be safe and secure unless the people, this large mass of people around us, they also get their food, they also get their livelihood. So I think uh, pharma, uh, as, we, as we always talk, our purpose, corporate purpose is caring for life. And uh, we have done a lot in terms of be it donation to the PM Cares Fund, various state disaster management authority funds, distributing PPE kits, uh, helping people for distributing food and everything else. Uh, I think that's a significant, meaningful responsibility that all of us have in the organized uh, corporate sector. And then collectively between risk management, uh, you know, task force uh, in the company, this compassionate work, organizing inward and outbound supply chain. I think between these three, four work stream, the whole uh, response to this crisis will appear uh, to be a very responsible kind of uh, engagement. Uh, that would be my thought. Thanks, Kedar. Thank you so much. And you said a line and I can't help but uh, say it on a lighter note, you know. Uh, you said this is once in a lifetime, uh, you know, coronavirus. 
and you know we mbas and uh, management people have this use of jargons i think things like disruption things like once in a lifetime i think truly for the first time in our lives these words make sense what does disruption mean the the way with the ease everybody used to use the word disruption that oh disrupting a category disrupting a company disrupting a i think this this uh, whole phase is the true disruption and on that let me come uh, to siddharth siddharth you are industry agnostic you don't you deal with all industries whether they hit with consumption right now or their essentials or their financial institutions you've done a lot of m and a lot of cross uh, industry work how do you see it because you must be talking to a lot of your clients who are in uh, so many different industries so why don't we bring in from you uh, a rather wider view of how you see this phenomena changing the world in the next couple of months uh thanks uh, uh, so i'll i'll you know i'll look at this in uh, you know two or three different buckets uh, i think all sectors have been hit by the same issues uh, uh, which is which are secular things like uh, you know cash cash flows come to a standstill uh, uh, the costs fixed costs have not gone away so there is a you know cash crunch working capital is constrained across the board logistics is a challenge uh, uh, staffing will also be a challenge specifically in some sectors which uh, employ a lot of human resources uh, so this what i call the pause mode which has been hit across all sectors of the economy and uh, 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 is something that needs to you know come into back into what what i call an operational mode i think that operational mode will be different for different industries i think we are speaking about consumer and retail uh, my own personal view is that uh, consumer as a sector will bounce back quickest in the economy because uh, we have the demographic advantage of a huge uh, uh, internal consumption that contributes to the gdp uh, similarly i think uh, as arjun was alluded to, to earlier i think uh, uh, while i uh, uh, we see some trends on moving to the digital format for retail i don't think that will uh, have an impact on how uh, traditional retail uh, which is the backbone of uh, i would say india's retail sector will go away i think uh, uh, developments such as malls will become more important uh, as entertainment destination and i think it augurs well for mall operators uh, you know, where uh, uh, you know customers actually coming to spend uh, a lot more money uh, even if they're not shopping there they are their, their dollars are being spent there well, what also uh, happens is uh, the other aspect is uh, you know capital requirement by the various sectors and uh, uh, you know something that stores to my heart and uh, uh, something that that i do is uh, how are, how will investors react to india as as an economy as a destination so some of the positive things uh, we foresee is that uh, in this whole doom and gloom when we come out india is actually going to be favorably ranked by the investors on a destination to deploy capital and that is to do with our domestic demand uh, uh, you know also uh, the you know i would say the impact of wanting to de-risk their supply chains from Uh, china today uh, india is probably one of the most viable destinations for global corporations to locate at least their second supply chain base uh, i think third is uh, uh, there are sectors such as healthcare financial services which are absolutely uh, you know i would say insulated from this crisis uh, logistically not but uh, from uh, demand side uh, uh, i think it uh, it is only something that is going to become more enhanced uh, so those uh, some of those things will drive the investor interest into india of course our capital markets are uh, you know uh, are are quite quite uh, efficient and vibrant uh, recently uh, in this entire crisis uh, india has seen the last single largest fdi deal uh, uh, that that has happened uh, in uh, in the telecom sector so uh, you know all these things actually makes me uh, believe as an optimist that we will emerge stronger but having said that i think how we act as a country how the sectors come together how people in various sectors come together will define how strong we emerge from this crisis thanks adar thanks and interesting take uh, 
uh, Anupam, uh, I'd like to start with you something and which I want all the panelists to answer. And I know it's a difficult one, but uh, as leaders, we don't have a choice but to put our take on what we feel. I think there's a lot of conversation on how the recovery will be. Let's move to the post-COVID world. So what do you think? It's going to be a V-shaped recovery, a U-shaped recovery, an L-shaped recovery. I mean, I've been talking to and watching and reading about many business leaders and the house is divided, but let's see what our panel has to stay starting with you, Anubhav. Yeah, so I, uh, thank you, Devinder. I think um, uh, definitely uh, from what we are hearing from our clients and what we are seeing, uh, everyone's hoping that it will come back to normal in three to six months. Uh, that's a very optimistic view and I'm glad people are optimistic like that, but the challenges still remain. Uh, we are already seeing situations in Maharashtra and Delhi and Gujarat and how the cases are coming around. And my sense is that uh, uh, without the logistical support, the, you know, with the supply chain being disrupted, even if you look at the essential industries, I think uh, without the support of the supply chain, uh, it's not going to be able to get things back to normal that quickly. Um, we were talking to our colleagues in China and uh, they are saying that uh, while they have reopened, uh, there's hardly much traction on the ground in terms of uh, how people are coming into the malls. And it's very tightly controlled. And the government there can do that uh, because they, they have very tight controls on uh, uh, people movement. So taking a cue from there, I think, uh, I think it'll be a slow recovery, probably a, probably a U, uh, but uh, it, it is going to be a deep trough. Uh, before a uh, recovery comes in. Thanks, thanks, Anupam. And I'm going to take this one with the, everybody because I think this impacts a lot. This impacts jobs. This impacts uh, salary cuts, if there be any. This impacts how the new normal becomes uh, normal. And this impacts our GDP, how quickly we can recover. So, Kedar, you're in pharma and you guys uh, are actually right in the front with essentials. What is your take? How will the recovery be? And, and say it for the larger economy, not just for pharma, because we know for pharma, it just actually is going to be great. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough, Devendra. See, uh, I think there are two, three angles of the recovery. Recovery would need uh, funding, you know. Uh, and uh, in these times, what every CFO or what every CEO uh, is doing is to squeeze the spends. And uh, squeezing the spends is a perfectly logical decision in our individual interest. But if you accumulate individual squeezing at the economic level, it's going to be creating havoc. Because effectively, we are uh, reducing consumption. And uh, not only consumption, uh, private investment and government investment also. Uh, we have little headroom in terms of increasing fiscal deficit in these times. Because if you increase the fiscal deficit beyond what it is now, uh, and real fiscal deficit will include state center and borrowings of the state-owned enterprises. So I think if you increase beyond the current, uh, let's say nine, nine and a half percent, I think there'll be challenge on the currency. There'll be challenge on interest rates. There'll be challenge on sovereign rating possibly. And none of us can afford uh, to hit anything like that. So what I'm trying to tell you, Devander, is the avenues to get the recovery back is basically uh, funding and funding can be done only by monetizing by printing notes and that again will have its uh, complications but uh, those can be tackled the later in short to survive and we have to ignite uh, the demand and the we have to create an appetite for spending and uh, uh, it's a tough choice if, if you ask me but because it's a tough choice and because the avenues to ignite the funding in the short term are not many I would tend to think that it's going to be a U-shaped recovery. And that's why my earlier comment that corporate executives have to demonstrate both uh, a sensitivity to shareholder interests and their enterprise interests, but along with compassion and empathy for the larger economy, the larger population is also equally important and that needs to be balanced. So net net to some of the vendor, I think a V-shaped recovery is almost ruled out because the asset values uh, the earlier pre-COVID growth patterns and demand patterns is going to take a lot of time to get back to those levels. I would probably think it's going to be a U-shaped recovery. 
Interesting, Kedar, and uh, while well, I'll come to Sudhar, let me go to Arjun first. So, Arjun, uh, whatever we heard from you on what you're talking to your customers that you know there might be uh, people might come back uh, quickly to the malls. What is your view? Uh, view? Would you differ, and would your view be a V-shaped recovery or would it be a U-shaped and L-shaped? What's your take? Yeah. So, uh, let me give you my take. I think uh, what Kedar mentioned, and I think even what Sudhar mentioned, the problem in the economy today is capital, capital, capital. I think that is really what is choking this, um, this situation for everybody because uh, when I speak of organized retail and I speak on behalf of shopping centers and the retailers, I think everyone is trapped for, for capital at this stage. Everyone is trapped for also you know, the supply chain logistics. How are they going to get it? I think if these two things get sorted, uh, you will see, of course, uh, it, it will be a U-shaped recovery. There's no question that we're going to see a, a U-shaped recovery, but it's also linked to the fact that, you know, are we going to really get rid of COVID so easily in the sense that we've seen that when economies like Singapore reopened, op they had to reclose down uh, Hong Kong, even Korea has had cases again. So we, rather than we or uh, a U-shape, I think it's going to be like a W. I think we're, we're going to be in for a period of uncertainty in the market uh, as, as we are all predicting. Uh, there will be, unfortunately, collateral damage. Uh, I think there will be uh, shopping malls that may fall apart. And I think Siddharth will be doing a lot of deals. Uh, so will there be a lot of uh, retailers who will suffer. Uh, I think there's going, to be, there's going to be a lot of blood on the street. Uh, I think it'll be interesting to see how some of the private equity that has funded some of this growth uh, over the last you know, decade how will they react? You know, how will they do? Will they do down rounds? Will they abandon those companies where they've invested? Um, I think it's going to be very interesting times for this whole industry. Uh, and I think uh, there is, uh, an, you know, referring to what Jamshed said in the beginning, companies that are professionally run, that run on transparency, trust, sustainability, uh, will be the true winners. And especially people who have, you know, proper balance sheets, uh, unlevered balance sheets or not over levered balance sheets. Let's put it this way. Uh, I have this theory that there were more, more balance sheets impaired before this COVID crisis. Uh, so, so, and they're trying to kind of uh, take cover under COVID at this point of time. Uh, I, I see Jamshed is <laughs> doing a thumbs up, but yeah, that's, that's a reality, you know, and, uh, but that, that's part, that's, that's part of economy of any, any, any world. So I guess it is going to be in my opinion a W. Uh, but yeah, good companies, good balance sheets, uh, sustainable businesses will certainly succeed. So interesting, Arjun, uh, as if life wasn't complicated with us grappling with V, U, U, V, you know, U shape, V shape, you've got a W now. So I think we are in alphabet world and UV, I hope we don't have any X and Y and Z. No, and, no, no, X and Y. And I get a w is a V and a V, so like recover and go back and recover. Absolutely. Jamshed, you've been in uh, many, many consumption sectors. Uh, You've been in hotels, you've been in retail, you've been in essentials. What's your take on this? See, I uh, personally believe that the shape of the recovery will be sector specific. But more importantly, it will be driven by the amount of quote unquote courage or risk that the government is willing to take. To me, that's the, that's the key point on which the pace of recovery will hinge. For example, if the government is going to adopt this, oh, we must be equitable across the country approach, I think we are going to have a problem. And the whole fracas around e-commerce serving non-essentials and then stopping serving non-essentials because the small retailers compared, complained about something related to unequal competition. Those kind of steps will actually hinder us more if the government feels that when they open, they have to open for everybody or nobody. To my mind, if the government takes a bold stand saying that we will open the safer areas first, irrespective of whether some small retailer or some small hotel or some small mall has to suffer because they don't comply with standards or norms or whatever it is, I think the recovery will be much faster. My suggestion would be that like we have various kind of certifications uh, in every industry, between industry and government bodies, we should quickly put in place a certification mechanism and start the process 
of certifying establishments as covid safe or not covid safe so that the time when the time comes to open up you just don't say all hotels or you don't say all restaurants you say look we've got a set of guidelines these guidelines are stringent and these are the hotels which are certified and every month they will undergo this certification so on and so forth if that happens according to me a calibrated recovery will in itself start attracting capital uh, from various sources including capital from governments and banks etc etc because they are seeing some movement uh, taking place so my personal view is it is all dependent on how risk taking in a manner of speaking risk taking the government is going to be and current indications show an element of abundant caution but i am thinking that by end may it will become better for example if you see road construction in non metro has already started so that industry certainly will show some acceleration and people will start having faith and i personally feel that's the way to go forward as far as we are concerned so i mean, i don't have a letter of the alphabet <laughs> <laughs> that's what i feel complicated more i think we've got another w so i think we've got one for the day so let me let me start with uh, siddharth uh i am of the firm view uh, and we can challenge that that the world tomorrow and not even because of covid covid will badly precipitate it it, it had already started that i think collaborations and partnerships is the way forward uh, for many industries like like i'll give you an example at nature's basket and spencers we were having shortage of delivery staff so imagine a situation where footfall in stores had gone down and orders online had gone up multiple times like i can't even i mean not like twice or thrice many 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 times and we didn't have the staff so luckily for us in two days we could stitch a lot of partnerships like we called uber and swiggy and uh, uber cars were trained on contactless delivery on hygiene standards and hundreds of cars are delivering because you know one bike can deliver two orders at one time and can make 10 trips in a day so maybe 15 orders in a day but a car can get 10 to 12 deliveries in one car and can make three to four trips so 40 deliveries with the same one man power so i think we we realize that without partnerships we can't do this alone uh, and this is just one example i think if you see in payments also in uh, e-commerce also you might be an e-com channel but you are taking payment from another company which could be competing with you so whether you call it uh, these new jargons called cooperation which is competitor and collaboration or cooperation i i believe the world tomorrow will slightly look different and industries or companies will look for partnerships i let's have a discussion on this siddharth starting with you what is your view what do you think may happen tomorrow and how does that impact uh, how companies must respond sure uh, so uh, i think you know the world was already changing uh, this crisis will expedite uh, uh, some of of that change uh, as you rightly said i think you know the world was already seeing a shared resources model coming together whether it is an uber or uh, weworks uh, it was about there are common resources uh, how does uh, how do you actually leverage those common resources to meet a demand rather than creating more supply uh now that that shared economy model uh, will get uh, expedited uh, through collaborations uh, I, i think businesses are going to take a step back and start thinking about uh, how do you actually uh, meet the demand by not creating more supply or by uh, you know partnering with uh, complementary skill sets from within the sector or outside the sector uh today some of these models which have come come around because of the crisis and to solve a problem will might become the new norm going forward uh, you know it is better to have the same vehicles on the roads delivering goods uh, carrying passengers uh, doing all other kind of thing than put more vehicles on the road for uh, you know uh, those different purposes i think very interestingly uh, you know in the us uh, what uh, I, uh, this crisis has done is that uh, some of the Uh, direct to home industries are actually utilizing driverless vehicles to make those deliveries now that calls for a convergence of technology on for in this example of driverless cars 
payments, uh, a lot of automation, robotics to make that happen. Now it's fascinating that something like this would have taken maybe five years to gather momentum, but due to the crisis, it's something that might gather momentum in six months. Uh, so I believe that these trends will only get expedited. Uh, uh, avenues to look for partnerships will get expanded. Uh, this crisis is a bit like uh, you know a, a war, a large war at a global scale. When we emerge from this war, the world will change and will change for the better by uh, people being more cognizant of uh, wanting to uh, convert, uh, conserve resources, uh, be more responsible. So, uh, uh, you know, and, and I'll just link back to, uh, you know, your, your question around the recovery. I think uh, India will certainly see a W recovery, but I think we have to, uh, or, you know, uh, the industry, the the people who are uh, in the driver's seat need to make sure that we don't, we actually convert this W recovery into a narrow U recovery because I think uh, uh, in a W there are two shocks and uh, the economy will suffer more rather than benefit. So, uh, you know, that might do bit from that. Then I, I can't agree more, Siddharth. I really can't agree more. I think uh, I can, you know, say that what we thought will take years and years for, uh, you know, even though we always had an app, always had an app, and we were always omni-channel. We were always doing a part of our business uh, through an app and uh, e-commerce. It would have taken four or five years to reach a number which we've just reached in a month. I think the number we are able to do now through our own e-commerce is significant. It's like no more in single digits. It's a very large number. And immediate priority for someone like us at Nature's Basket and Spencer's is that I just don't see ourselves as physical or brick and mortar retailer at all going forward ever. And, and I think what would have happened in years has happened in a month. Uh, I think, and we all have to react to it. Arjun, what's your take? You have a lot of retailers and you know, we haven't touched, I want you to touch uh, because you'll have, uh, you would be housing even apparel, journal, merchandise, sports. I think something uh, I would like you to represent. How do you think, uh, is there a possibility of partnerships, collaborations, or do you see them go back to the way it was business before? Well, I hope there is collaboration. I pray there is collaboration because I think, first of all, what we are advocating as, as a shopping center, and I say for myself, is, is that we understand the pain uh, that everyone is going through. And I think it's going to be about finding, finding reasonable grounds of meeting together. So I think at the first level, as shopping centers and retailers, uh, it'll be all our endeavor to find a good meeting ground. Uh, we both need each other. Uh, the retailers need, need us. We need them. So I think that's the first collaboration and partnership that we will see emerging. And I would be delighted, for example, if, if, if retailers could also collaborate. And I think the delivery model that you explained is, is absolutely brilliant, you know how you can all work together. And I think um, these, uh, these uh, garments, beauty people will kind of find ways and means of doing it. The interesting part is that uh, a lot of organized retail is in groups. So, you know, we know that, uh, let's say, uh, you know, the shopper stock group, for example, uh, they have a whole bunch of beauty and under their brand. So they can probably collaborate within their brands to begin with. Similarly, that could probably go for the House of Tata's, the House of Reliance, the House of Birla's, you know, Arvind's, they all, all have, have fairly large footprints of multiple brands. So I think the first collaboration will really become, begin with the malls and the retailers. Second will be retailers within their own brands because even now some of them were kind of competing with each other. So I think there will be collaboration uh, that will certainly emerge. And third, I hope they do. Um, and I think the food industry, the restaurant industry will probably see more collaboration than anybody else because they, if they're delivering they would probably you know, use your model to deliver in a car, use Uber, because you can do more delivery. So I think we will see various levels of collaboration going forward. And, and I think we as shopping centers would support it immensely. Whatever we can do to facilitate such a, such a partnership uh, it would be brilliant. So to give you an example, at our own shopping center, three years ago, uh, we just started doing free home delivery for anyone who wants to leave their bags, uh, go and see a movie. So we were doing it as a free service. And I think we will continue to do that as a free service. So even if you, if you buy, buy something and you want the mall to deliver it, the mall will be happy to deliver it. So I think these are very small investments you will make, but you will basically build a partnership with the customer long term. And I think that's really what you want to, you want to see emerging happening, even in this moment of crisis. 
Uh, thanks, Arjun. Thank you so much. That that throws a lot of light. Jamshed, uh, in the previous webinar, uh, somebody asked this of you, and uh, I want to repeat that and borrow from it uh, exactly what was asked of you. That if you were the chairman of Tata Sons, given that uh, or CEO, because the group is into so many businesses, Tata Consumer, which is essentials, you have retail, you have apparel tie-ups globally, Indian brands, you have technology companies, you have software, pretty much everything. How do you see? Do you see any collaboration partnerships within industries on the lines which we are speaking, or what is your take? Personally, feel that. Uh the age of collaboration will enter a totally new era now. And the kind of collaboration that we will see is actually unlikely people getting together uh, in order to deliver the best value to customers. The classic example that I quote is that uh, of Sayadri Farms, who from Nasik is supplying a box to my home using Scootsy. So, you know, so farmers on one side, uh, hyper-local delivery on the other side are tying up together and offering a service to customers. Now, coming to the Tata group, uh, I think the collaboration will move, uh, in my view, or any large group for that matter, will move from a nice-to-do thing as part of being part of a Tata ecosystem to a must-to-do. I think it would be uh, sort of not appropriate for any group which has a diverse business not to create formal structures now to ensure collaboration. I mean, so we have got Chroma, which is moving goods. We've got Titan, which is moving goods. We've got Star, which is moving goods. And a hell of a lot of Tata companies are moving goods. And there is no need or no reason why that movement of goods and I'm not saying that uh, it will all happen in the old clunky fashion of moving goods by forming a separate logistics company. I'm not talking about that. That many companies have done. For example, Future Group has done that. They have a company for virtually every part of their business. I'm talking about leveraging digital platforms, leveraging technology to make sure that while the companies have their own independence, they are using a technology platform or a digital platform to collaborate. And I think that will be the way forward, that it will be a sense of collaboration without necessarily creating separate entities or ownership structures, which will drive the way forward. And the only factor which will drive this relationship forward is a mutual economic advantage, which I think people are seeing in a very glaring fashion right now. And this can also extend, it's not only about supply chain, it can extend to sharing customers it can extend to sharing uh, the labor force, which we find is, is currently a big bottleneck. So I see a totally different business model and companies and groups of companies. They need not be part of one group, just groups of companies which can come together actually can make a huge difference uh, to the way the economy is uh, run. I mean, we are in food retail. We operate at 20, 22% margins. And then there are pharmacies all over the country and they operate on similar margins and similar models, you know. I see, I see this as a big turning point in, in, in world economy, but certainly in Indian economy. Thanks, Jamshed. And talking of mangoes, you guys in West in Mumbai are much closer to mangoes. And uh, I know given your loyalties to Star Bazaar, but in case you ever want, Nature's Basket is also selling. Oh, oh my whole colony is asking me, where do we get mangoes from? And through Scootsio, whichever. <laughs> in, uh, done, uh, done, done. So, yeah, sorry, Arjun, you were saying something. You're missing I'm, mangoes. Yeah, I'm missing mangoes. I will take you up on that. Absolutely. We are planning to bring them to the north part soon. So, Anupam, uh, let's have your take on collaborations and partnership. I think uh, you guys are working with many, many industries. What's your take? I think the first thing that we are seeing is uh, basically uh, a fair amount of, uh, you know, offline channels trying to come online. And uh, uh, very recently, I connected a couple of uh, folks who were trying to evaluate uh, how do I get into uh, more on online uh, measure. Uh, you gave your example of how you've done this uh, for your organization. But the kind of uh, questions or the kind of evaluations people are currently doing, trying to just figure out how do we get more into mind share of people? How do we get into 
uh, you know the channels that we had previously not explored so there's a one uh, very good example where uh, the company is trying to get local people of a community together and uh, they download pictures these people download pictures for others uh, who may not have access to a smartphone so this is tier 3 tier 4 towns and uh, you know they will download pictures from the marketplace like amazon or wherever else and uh, show those pictures to um, their local community members who can then place orders on behalf of them uh, the other is aggregating of demand so you take an advance take a take an order list and then aggregate that and send that forward to a distributor so i think all of these are new models of how people can uh, uh, cooperate and compete and a lot of these are i think people have moved away on just thinking about you know my top line my business and are working more closely with the uh, uh, you know various parts of the value chain uh, that we are seeing now thanks anupam and uh, let let me start with you anupam and this one uh, i think we all need to know because we've all learned business management or working life whichever roles it may be including of all the participants so i want everybody to answer two things one is leadership how do you think leadership will change uh, because of this uh, covid 19 uh, episode in our lives uh, and i and i'm sure it will have massive repercussions the world can be like uh, you know bc and ad i think we can call uh, bc before covid and uh, ac after covid world and i think the same management principle or at least leadership principles uh while by and large they remain the same but i'm sure there is something new we've learned why don't we all share what is our take on how leadership will evolve and also then for the larger workforce so that all the participants can benefit what, what do you think uh, everybody should do now for the post covid world to stay relevant whether it be skills whether it be new learnings uh why don't we start with you anupam and answer these two first on our own leadership and two for the larger workforce i my view is that you know the the good old uh, virtues still uh, remain relevant i think uh, empathy becomes a very big leadership trait now um leadership uh, with empathy uh, in a view to balance uh, all sorts of uh, stakeholders right india is a very diverse country uh, jamshed refer to you know how do you manage expectations of everyone so it's it's not an easy task but uh, being empathetic towards uh, if you're talking about an organization being empathetic towards all sorts of uh, employees all sorts of demands of those people um, i'm seeing some of the retailers taking very very strong steps on uh, adding more workforce to give slack in the uh distribution and uh, stocking of items so that you know you, you don't have too many people uh coming in at the same time from their side and uh, overcrowding the shelves or the stacking process so you know just just to make sure that uh, there is social distancing within the workers they added more shifts and more people onto that um you know i've also seen people create very continuous channels of communication uh, with all employees uh, you know there were i think two employees tested positive in an organization and the the top leadership was tracking them uh, very very closely uh, these are instances of you know looking at uh, your organization more holistically just than looking at mis and uh, data numbers and i'm very glad that some of these things are uh coming up as examples for even others to follow and you know whatever tone is set at the top uh, the middle management and people around then uh, emulate that so i think that's a very very good uh, experience that i'm seeing uh, across our clients or organizations anupam anything for the larger workforce i think um, if, i think everyone has to realize that uh, you know this is a challenge that will uh put constraints on everyone so i think the expectations have to be kept in light of uh, what kind of constraints are coming across and how do we navigate uh, those constraints and you know still be able to deliver some goals 
so uh, having realistic expectations on uh, on the goals on the targets and how do we go about achieving them even productivity for that matter right I, i don't think it's going to be at the same levels you have to find ways i know everyone says they are working harder or longer hours in the lockdown but uh, what does that do to the productivity and i've got mixed uh, experiences you know some say that it's taking us longer to get things done uh, over a video conference and some are saying that uh, well the accessibility is increased everyone's available you know you don't have to worry about people traveling and not being available so uh, i think you have to balance all those views uh, for the workforce and see how that kind of pans out for the organization now thank you anupam let me come to you arjun please reflect on uh, how leadership may uh, i can't say change because of course the basic principles remain the same but uh, evolve and then a message uh, for the larger workforce for everybody for all of us what we should be doing for the future devinder i think uh, these are moments when you know the distinction between men and boys will emerge you know question mark uh, you will see uh, some really really good examples of leadership uh um, you know you will see good examples of leadership across the chain uh, across the whole the whole you know management chain for instance you know i was reviewing uh, a strategy internally a couple of days ago and and our ceo came up with this whole plan of uh, of a distributed leadership pattern where you know cross functional teams even someone who is involved in for example um uh, construction was going to help the leasing team because the leasing team is very small they they just have a two or member two or three member team and now suddenly they have to deal with 250 retailers all in one go so you know there's a lot of cross functionality emerging and i think that will really show the strength of organizations how they recruited and how they they continue to motivate their people there will be some pain uh, i hope the pain is not going to be too severe on on on, on people i hope the government comes out with some sort of a bailout package where you know especially at the bottom end uh, you get some direct transfer for people i think it's the you know after capital that's the second requirement that industry has has put forward to the government and i understand that the government's you know obviously hands are constrained this is a large country large population and and it's unfair to give examples of what other smaller countries have done but i think i'm confident that the government will come with something and i think obviously it'll be at the lower end but i think this will also reflect where there's a collaboration between the government the private sector as well as the employees will also have to take some sort of a haircut at some level and and all put their differences aside and just work to make sure that their their companies their country their cities all recover in a collaborative manner i i, I don't think this is this is going to be only the problem of of top leadership it's, it's a problem that goes through the entire value chain and it has to be communicated very well it has to be communicated uh, extremely well it has to be communicated with a lot of compassion and 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 i think the the distinction between men and boys will emerge very very clearly and we're already seeing that happening you know we're seeing some panic in some companies um, and we're seeing some really good examples in some companies so let's 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 wait and watch the jury is not out there yet thanks arjun kedar let me come to you uh, how even though you guys are busy right now i'm sure you've got at least some time to give this a thought on the leadership at our for all of us for yourself and then uh, what would the larger workforce should be doing right now to adapt to the new normal of the future yeah absolutely uh, devanda i think uh, these are the times for compassionate matured visionary leadership to take over uh, from short term is and uh, uh, probably corporate kind of leadership if i can call it i think uh, what we are going through is much larger crisis it's hitting the entire mankind and uh, what we have been usually taught and what we practice in terms of stakeholder interest uh, or shareholder interest i think the definition of that needs to be changed so i would think that going forward a much more uh, wide canvas distributed leadership will take precedence over individualistic leaderships the kind of kpis that you will pursue the kind of goals that you will pursue the kind of scorecard metrics that you will drive will definitely have linkage towards sustainability uh, towards uh, public good towards societal you know benefit uh, you know because the survival of the entire mankind is is as is become an issue so i would certainly think that uh, that that's the new era of uh, you know philosophers and uh, business academicians will tend to look at leadership in a very different angle uh, when it comes to uh, workforce uh, uh, 
I think uh, what we are practicing is a lot of empathy. What we are practicing is little less focus on productivity because the anxiety uh, in everybody's mind that I am working from home. Will my manager or will my boss uh, seek assurance that I am really working? And how do I prove that I'm productive? So I think there are stories that people are having lunch at five o'clock in the evening. There are stories of employees sending emails at two o'clock in the night. People wake up early at eight o'clock. They go to bed at you know 10, 11 in the night. Somebody is not able to take a bath during the day and things like that. These are all horror stories. And the families are troubled. I mean, you have your uh, bread owner at home, but uh, he or she is probably locked up in a room completely in front of the screen. So I think whatever is going through is something which is uh, really uh, adding a lot of stress. And uh, that's what I feel, Devender, to answer your question. I think uh, a lot of empathy, a lot of compassion, a uh, little long-term vision, collective vision towards the mankind will, uh, will get demonstrated. The definition of stakeholder interest will change. Uh, should we pursue market cap? Uh, should we pursue uh, mankind's uh, collective benefit? All that is going to phenomenally alter our our thinking. Thanks, Kedar. Uh, Siddharth, I'd like you to answer the same one, please. Sorry, I was a mute. Uh, so I, I think I, I would uh, uh, you know agree with what uh, the fellow panelists have said, uh, and I, I'll summarize it as: uh, if this is a time to put people before profit. Uh, it's important that uh, the individuals, which are the people in each organization, uh, are uh, given a sense of security. Uh, in times of crisis, emotions actually uh, uh, get overplayed. And I think uh, as leaders, we have to be cognizant of those emotions and make sure that we deal with that to give people the security and the confidence that uh, things will get better. Uh, I think economically also it's important because uh, the the larger staff, the, the workers, the wage earners are the people who also fuel the demand. So protecting employment in a way is also going to help, you know, turn the economic life cycle uh, uh, again, uh, that, that pause button that I talked about earlier will only get removed from there. Uh, I think we're seeing, uh, you know, uh, leaders emerge. We are seeing organize the distance between the men and the boys, as Arjun put it, uh, uh, getting more and more uh, uh, clearer uh, as a result of this crisis. And I think leadership will be all about collaborating, will be all about, uh, you know, taking everyone along. Thanks, Siddharth. Jamshed, uh, your take on this? Yeah, I have a couple of uh, areas where I think leadership will have to focus on or uh, certainly change. The first on a technical side is, I think leadership will now realize the need to really, really understand and be digitally savvy. I don't think there is any other option and many CEOs consider being digitally savvy equal to being on social media, that's not what it is. Mm -hmm. But the end-to-end -end digitization of a corporation will only be driven when CEOs really understand digital from a business perspective in its true depth and width. On the more softer side, while I agree that the focus currently is on empathy with your workforce, I think I feel that that focus will shift to a larger empathy to look at problems of the nation and how uh, as corporates and as corporate leaders, we can all work towards resolving them. Uh, building toilets is not something which is Modi's dream and, you know, some of us put our CSR money into it. Creating hygienic work environment, uh, creating hygienic cities and creating hygienic living uh, conditions for the people of India is no longer some government thing which we are all sort of talking about. I think given the kind of problems of our nation which have now been highlighted because of this, for example, the whole migrant worker issue, which none of us realize the magnitude of that. And these are the same migrant workers we use in our industry in some way, shape or form. And I think it is that empathy which will, which will actually uh, step up and uh, help create a better India. For example, today, most companies allocate a CSR fund based on government norms. Uh, why should you restrict yourself to government norms is the question leaders will start asking. Can we not do something more than what the government is uh, asking us to do 
in order to change the shape and future of the country. So I think one is sensitive leaders will start thinking along these lines. The second is, I think the interaction between industry and government will change. See, our government's pushback always has been, and we are all part of industry bodies, is you guys keep coming and asking for concessions. <laughs> you know? And finally, we need to have the pockets to give it to you. I think it will become a lot more collaborative. And I think we will all sit together to find common solutions which benefit the nation and then benefit the companies, as opposed to today, the kind of solutions that we are asking, which really benefit the companies. And sometimes then we say, okay, maybe by default, it will benefit the nation. So I do see, I do see that changing. And I also see the government becoming more forthcoming to industry. They've demonstrated that during the crisis. And there is a new equation which has been built, at least at central government, between government and industry. And I see leaders taking that relationship forward for the good of the nation. On the larger workforce piece, I feel that our current understanding of how our people live their lives is very limited. We really treat them as factors of production. Whatever we may say, finally, they are a line in the PNL and we treat them as factors of production and we make sure that we give them adequate money, et cetera, et cetera. I think our whole approach to our teams will change. Many, in many cases, the teams have really outdone themselves. You will be knowing in Spencer's itself how people have, you know, it's not about the money. It's that sense of loyalty that they've exhibited, which is so huge that I feel that as corporates, we have not duly recognized it and we are not duly rewarding it. And I think that will, uh, that will change. And companies and leadership will really look at ways and means of making employers, employees much more equal stakeholders in the company than they are today. I don't quite know how, but certainly that's a way forward because then that's sustainable. And that's something which you can then carry through. So these are my thoughts on how leadership can and ought to change given what we've learned. Thanks, Jamshed. And uh, I think it's a reminder what you, what you just said. I think all of us, especially you, me, I'm in pharma, people who are essentials and working right now, thousands of our people are delivering every day uh, out there. I think we can't thank them enough and uh, nothing explains the turnout of attendance, which started in the beginning, which was less, but it trickled up and has reached very good levels that even though everybody was getting paid, despite if they turn up or not, I mean, people turned up as the call of duty. I think it's a, it's a humble uh, lesson on leadership for, for, for myself and for, I, I'm sure for all of us on the second part, I think thanks to industry bodies like Fiki, I think Lena is there on the call. We need to thank people like Lena. I, and I can't agree more with you that the kind of interaction we've had with the government and their forthcoming and the support with so many ministries, I'm sure Jamshed, you and me have been a part of so many, so many every day on webinars with the government, with senior people, including even sub ministers. I think it's a different level of uh, uh, support, which we have seen coming up in the conversation is far is very very conducive so i think uh, with that uh, i think we are we've actually running out of time but there are some questions i see and i'm going to attempt very few because there are too many uh, questions but here's one for you arjun uh, how do you see luxury brands at this stage any merchandising input for retail buying teams for season buying this is specifically for you somebody has sent uh, that's a tough one because really uh, I'm not a hardcore retailer, but from the gut, it certainly tells me that uh, in the short to medium term, uh, it's going to be not just a Black Friday kind of a sales approach, but a, you know, a, a one month kind of an approach to, to make sure that uh, you, it's all going to be offer led. Uh, it's not going to be full price merchandise is not going to sell uh, as well as offer driven. Uh, as far as luxury goes, you know, we have contra, contra signals. Uh, in the case when China opened, you know, the Louis Vuitton store in Gongsa sold $2.6 million on day one. But that is China. That is not India. So I think India is still a very, very value conscious uh, uh, country. Um, and, and if, if uh, luxury can bundle offers, uh, I think they, they have to look at it from that perspective. 
So while there is a supply you know, chain constraint, there is also a lot of supply sitting either midway or in store. And I think uh, we're already running out of the, the existing summer season. So I think uh, whatever they can merchandise and offer to the customer is offer driven, uh, even if it is luxury, will probably be a more smarter way of dealing with, uh, with, the, with, the, with that question. Fantastic. I think there's another interesting one uh, and anyone can take that. Uh, it says sustainability and continuity are closely linked. Going forward, do you think there's going to be a greater focus on sustainability in our industries and uh, anybody can throw light on? I think Jamshed to take that. Jamshed. You know, personally, I feel that uh, companies won't have a choice because customers will start pushing back. So up to now, uh, the whole uh, push on sustainability has been by the company and then hoping that it would use, they could use some of it to impress the customer. But now I think it will change. I think it is the customer who will start pushing back and start gravitating towards brands, establishments, et cetera, et cetera, which are de demonstrating a responsible way of doing business. I won't look at just sustainability in a narrow sense, but a responsible way of doing business. And I personally feel that customers have realized that they rather spend on less number of things, which they are seeing now, but rather spend well with uh, brands and companies which, which are doing good. So I feel, of course, the answer is yes, but the pressure will come a lot more from customers. It will become a norm rather than today it becoming uh, a delight. That's the way I feel uh, it will go. It will take time, but I think that's the way it will go. Arjun, yeah, sure, you want to add. Yeah. Devinda, you know, I, I've always wanted to ask you this question, and I think it's linked to the sustainability factor. We've seen in the world that, you know, a lot of us have given lip service to the word sustainability. I, I, you know, House of Tata's is one great example of, of having done it very well, but a lot of us haven't done sustainability very well. Wouldn't a business like you at this point of crisis look at maybe creating a, a format which is without packaging, you know, a packaging less format. We've seen that emerging in the world. These are trends which are emerging in the world. And sometimes as, as, as retailers, we struggle to find partners who are, who are able to pick these trends which are happening globally. You know, the whole vegan culture, which is across the world, which is growing. You know, we, we barely struggle to find restaurants in India which are vegan. We struggle to find these, you know, zero waste companies. You know, in the grocery store, you know how much packaging that goes into it. And it's not something that hasn't been done. There are enough Western models out there. So I think these could be times when, you know, when our management teams have the bandwidth um, to, to make business plans for the future. So something for you to consider and, and maybe for the larger industry to consider uh, some of these new no, ways. No, absolutely, Arjun. It's a, it's a food for thought. And I think uh, through one of our chain, Nature's Basket, you'll be surprised that the non-packaged fresh is the highest proportion percentage mix, like it would go to 30, 40%. While in normal grocery retailers, it would be sub 10%. Brilliant. Uh, things like vegan or, you know, keto or food or, you know, organic, uh, you know, food, the kind of growth rates we are seeing. Again, I go back to the point that what we thought will take a couple of years is happening in months. I think the whole movement towards freshness, uh, towards more, Shots, like I can tell you one trend which I'm seeing, like you see some of the categories, which of course in this time, it's very subjective. It may be very relevant to the COVID times, like chocolate sales have gone up contrary to that. It might be discretionary, but it is kids are at home. Parents have to manage kids at home. There are no desserts. So a lot of customers I spoke to saying that after dinner, they have one piece of chocolate. That's, that's a dessert. Maybe not everybody is comfortable making a pastry or a full cake at home. Uh, you know, a couple of categories are down like shaving and, uh, and beauty right now, because people are at, people are at home. Absolutely. But one, one of the big trends, which I see going forward is you see the whole world in the processed food world and packaging to get more and more, uh, shelf life, you know, the shelf life now of some of the products have become 12 months and 24 months and. You know, we keep uh, making it longer and longer so they can travel farther and they have, you know, there are no wastages. I think a reversal of some bit of that trend, not very large extent, small, small ones, but short shelf life will be back in our life, which is more towards freshness 
and will lead and support the whole sustainability movement. So I think that's my take and uh, something uh, I would be very keen uh, to explore uh, for us. I think Vivita, we... Uh, Vivita, you, no Vivita, you, you make that first so I promise you we'll give you a store at Select City Walk if you have a small format ready for that. And absolutely. We're going to come back to you. We have a great mall. Absolutely. We've always been very fond of Select. I think uh, there's one more last one I'll attempt and then we'll close it. I think on, there is a suggestion on community buying. So again, I can add on that a new part of business which we've started is these RWA, what we call cooperative societies in Mumbai or resident welfare associations. Again, thanks to the issues to solve for, we started putting a box in buildings uh, where there were people 400, 500,000 you know, apartments. And we would pick an, pick an order at 12 o'clock or one o'clock and there'll be 100, 150 orders put together from people. And that all the orders would get picked in a store, put in a truck and brought back to the building and what would need 20, you know, 100 customers to come out or 20 people to deliver in so many trips can happen only in one trip and within an hour. So I think community buying has started. Uh, is anybody, Jamshed, anyone wants to speak? Does community buying has a future post COVID though I know it's very relevant right now. Uh, any, any take Jamshed from you, Arjun, Siddharth, Anupam, Kedar, anyone? So uh, if, if I may uh, just go, I think community buying uh, is something that, uh, you know, again, uh, what it helps is it helps uh, making businesses more sustainable, right? You're, you, you are actually uh, aggregating demand and allowing, uh, if, if nothing else, the logistics uh, cost to come down, fuel consumption to come down. I think there's also a, a, a community buying at a B2B level, if I may just talk about that for a second. Uh, I, uh, somebody mentioned Sahadri, uh, the Cooperative. So Sahadri is a farmer producer organization. It is, uh, I think, the largest uh, producer and exporter of table grapes in the world. Uh, it has recently been invested by a private equity. So here is a set of farmers who are technologically savvy, who have adopted the best agriculture practices, come together, looked at a specific market, and built a business model around that. That is not just good from a, a you know, from a, a employment creation, but also from an investor uh, standpoint. So I think, uh, again, in the new normal, some of these things will become uh, a lot more uh, frequent and uh, will help, you know, uh, uh, save resources. Uh, and and I, I'd also just quickly also add that I think sustainability is going to be very much part of what uh, we refer to as being a responsible corporate citizen. Uh, I think that you will see a lot more organizations becoming responsible, sustainability, uh, employment creation. And, and I think, you know, looking at deploying profit over and beyond just uh, shareholder return. Thanks. Anyone, anyone uh, on community buying, Arjun, Jamshed, Anupam? So, uh, uh, I'm good. Peter, I, think, I think this is certainly a, a great opportunity. It's, it's like, you know, today uh, you need to be where the customer is. And then if, if, if grocery uh, and, and essentials can reach the community without them having to step out. Can you imagine the saving on the carbon footprint, you know, in a, in a building society, which has say 100, 200 flats. And if your van goes in there, let's say, you know, two hours a day, uh, you're saving so much carbon footprint from going out. So it's also sustainable. Secondly, you're reaching the customer. You have a better pulse of what the customer wants, what he needs, what's the aspiration. I think this, this is a great opportunity to take advantage of it and build, you know, through your teams uh, or through anybody, you know, uh, with these societies and build a long-term partnership. It should not just be a COVID-driven situation. I think these are certainly going to be high impact. And can you imagine that that takes, takes away so much pressure on your rentals? Uh, you know, it's, it's a new stream of growth completely. I, I would embrace it if I was in, in, in your business. Fantastic. I think uh, pretty much we are done and we are also on our time. It's uh, about to be 1230. I think uh, Anupam, even though I leave it on you uh, for closing or Siddharth, but I'd like to thank uh, Arjun, Jamshed, uh, Kedar, you Anupam, Siddharth, both of you for organizing this with Fikhi. I think this is uh, not the last one. I think many, many more webinar and such discussions are required for this massive phenomena which has hit our lives. And I think we are still in work in progress mode as far as our thoughts are concerned. But thank you. Thank you so much everyone uh, for taking out your time. I learned a lot from each one of you and I leave it at this note. Anupam, over to you. 
Thank you, Devendra. Thanks. Thanks for Siddharth, excellent. Maybe you instruction. would like to close, Siddharth? Yes, uh, I'd like to. You know, first, uh, you know, and foremost, thank Mr. Chavla for moderating what was a very engaging and uh, insightful session. Uh, I think uh, it was uh, very, very refreshing to hear the views from uh, all the leaders from the industry. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chawla. Thank you, all the panelists. Uh, I think we have uh, conducted a survey uh, within the sector, and uh, we will share the findings of that survey with everybody who's attended the webinar. You may find some of those uh, uh, findings uh, interesting. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the need of the hour is to collaborate, to get together, exchange ideas, not reinvent the wheel, but uh, leverage off each other's experiences and uh, emerge from this crisis. Uh, as uh, Winston Churchill says, never let a good crisis go to waste. And I think that's an opportunity for us as a country and for us uh, as leaders in the sector.